Saul's Conversion by George Whitfield, 1714 through 1771. But Saul increased the more in strength and confounded the Jews which dwelt at Damascus, proving that this is very Christ. Acts 9:22. It is an undoubted truth, however it may seem a paradox to natural men, that whosoever will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. And therefore it is very remarkable that our blessed Lord in his glorious Sermon on the Mount, after he had been pronouncing those blessed who were poor in spirit, meek, pure in heart, and such like, immediately adds and spends no less than three verses in this beatitude. Blessed are they who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. No one ever was or ever will be endowed with the aforementioned graces in any degree, but he will be persecuted for it in a measure. There is an irreconcilable enmity between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent, and if we are not of the world, but show by our fruits that we are of the number of those whom Jesus Christ has chosen out of the world, for that very reason the world will hate us. As this is true of every particular Christian, so it is true of every Christian church in general. For some years past, we have heard but little of a public persecution. Why? Because but little of the power of godliness has prevailed amongst all denominations. The strong man, armed, has had full possession of most professors' hearts, and therefore he has let them rest in a false peace. But we may assure ourselves, when Jesus Christ begins to gather in his elect in any remarkable manner and opens an effectual door for preaching the everlasting gospel, persecution will flame out and Satan and his emissaries will do their utmost, though all in vain, to stop the work of God. Thus it was in the first ages, thus it is in our days. And thus it will be, till time shall be no more. Christians and Christian churches must then expect enemies. Our chief concern should be to learn how to behave towards them in a Christian manner. For unless we take good heed to ourselves, we shall embitter our spirits and act unbecoming the followers of that Lord, who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, threatened not, and as a lamb before his shearers is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. But what motive shall we make use of to bring ourselves to this blessed lamb-like temper? Next to the immediate operation of the Holy Spirit upon our hearts, I know of no consideration more conducive to teach us long-suffering towards our most bitter persecutors than this, that for all that we know to the contrary, some of those very persons who are now persecuting may be chosen from all eternity by God, and hereafter called in time to edify and build up the church of Christ. The persecutor Saul, mentioned in the words of the text, and whose conversion, God willing, I propose to treat of in the following discourse, is a noble instance of this kind. I say a persecutor, and that a bloody one, for see how he is introduced in the beginning of this chapter. And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of our Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. And Saul, yet breathing out, 
This implies that he had been a persecutor before, to prove which we need only look back to the seventh chapter, where we shall find him so very remarkably active at Stephen's death that the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. He seems, though young, to be in some authority. Perhaps for his zeal against the Christians, he was preferred in the church and was allowed to sit in the great council or Sanhedrin. For we are told, Acts 8, 1, that Saul was consenting unto his death. And again, at verse 3, he is brought in as exceeding all in his opposition. For thus speaks the evangelist. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house, and hailing men and women, committed them to prison. One would have imagined that this should have satisfied, at least abated the fury of this young zealot. No, being exceedingly mad against them, as he himself informs Agrippa, and having made havoc of all in Jerusalem, he now is resolved to persecute the disciples of the Lord, even to strange cities, and therefore yet breathing out threatening. Breathing out. The words are very emphatical and expressive of his bitter enmity. It was as natural to him now to threaten the Christians as it was for him to breathe. He could scarcely speak, but it was some threatenings against them. Nay, he not only breathed out threatenings, but slaughter also. And those who threaten would also slaughter if it were in their power against the disciples of the Lord. Insatiable, therefore, as hell, finding he could not refute or stop the Christians by force of argument, he is resolved to do it by force of arms, and therefore went to the high priest, for there never was a persecution yet without a high priest at the head of it and desired of him letters issued out of his spiritual court to the synagogues or ecclesiastical courts at Damascus, giving him authority, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem, I suppose to be arraigned and condemned in the high priest's court. Observe how he speaks to the Christians. Luke, who wrote the Acts, calls them disciples of the Lord, and Saul styles them men and women of this way. I doubt not, but he represented them as a company of upstart enthusiasts that had lately gotten into a new method or way of living that would not be content with temple service, but they must be righteous overmuch, and have their private meetings, or conventicles, and break bread, as they called it, from house to house, to the great disturbance of the established clergy, and to the utter subversion of all order and decency. I do not hear that the high priest makes any objection. No, he was as willing to grant letters as Saul was to ask them, and wonderfully pleased within himself to find he had such an active zealot to employ against the Christians. Well then, a judicial process is immediately issued out with the high priest's seal affixed to it, and now, methinks, I see the young persecutor finely equipped and pleasing himself with thoughts how triumphantly he should ride back with men and women of this way, dragging after him to Jerusalem. What a condition may we imagine the poor disciples at Damascus were in at this time. No doubt they had heard of Saul's imprisoning and making havoc of the saints at Jerusalem, and we may well suppose were apprised of his design against them. I am persuaded this was a growing, because a trying time with these dear people. Oh, how did they wrestle with God in prayer, beseeching Him either to deliver them from or give them grace sufficient to enable them to bear up under the fury of their persecutors. 
the high priest doubtless, with the rest of his reverend brethren, flattered themselves that they should now put an effectual stop to this growing heresy, and waited with impatience for Saul's return. But he that sitteth in heaven laughs them to scorn. The Lord has them in derision. And therefore, verse 3, as Saul journeyed and came even near unto Damascus, perhaps to the very gates, our Lord permitting this, to try the faith of his disciples, and more conspicuously, to baffle the designs of his enemies. Suddenly, at midday, as he acquaints Agrippa, there shined round about him a light from heaven, a light brighter than the sun. And he fell to the earth, why not into hell? And heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me?' 